Okay. Well done. Anyway, uh, welcome to our uh, annual meeting. The uh, what usually is the last meeting of the year, but uh, this year we're going to have just one more after this. Uh, but we'll talk about that later. Um, we have to, the first thing we have to do, and I know all of you remember distinctly last year's meeting. And so when you read the minutes, you knew that there were probably some changes that needed to be made, right? <laughs> do I have an approval of the minutes from the 2023 annual meeting? Yes. Do we have any dissents? Uh, if we do, I'm asking you to leave. But anyway, <laughs> all right. So the minutes have been approved. Um, if you don't know, the Crestwood Historical Society has actually, after all of these years, decided to take one small step into the 21st century. Uh, last year, I talked about the fact that we were going to get our website back up and running. And thanks to our trustee, Kurt Neidert, who said, not only that we can do it, but that he would actually see that it got done. He did, and now Natalie Barca is our webmaster. So we actually have an online, if you care to go to those things, uh, website for the Crestwood Historical Society. That means that members will be receiving the annual report via email. Uh, unless you do not have an email, in which case it will be delivered by the Pony Express. Mm -hmm. It also means that memberships can be renewed online uh, for all of those who don't have checks, don't want to use checks, never saw a check ever in their life. Uh, you can now uh, join online. Um, and there are those of us who still write checks and only use checks. And so we um, um, we can still do that too. Um, as I've said before uh, in the past, and um, I, I want to, I, I plan on repeating this every year, that none of this could happen without the volunteer officers and trustees and the time and effort that they've put into this. Z and her library staff for making this place available to us and welcoming to us. And Betty Giordano, who I get her into making something every time and she willingly agrees to do it. And she has made the, uh, the, the fudge brownies that have coffee and chocolate chips and cinnamon in them. So, and she made them small so you can take more than one. And also, you know, as and if any of you are have been listening to your local um, WNYC station, none of this really, truly, can be done without you, our members. So I want to thank all of you for for your support of us. Um, we do have a few business items this this year. Um, the board uh, reviewed the bylaws of the society and agreed that there needed to be some changes. Uh, so we are asking for your approval for the following changes. The first was to um, update uh, how you can apply for membership because now since you can do it online, it had to make a reference to that. Um, so we are asking you to approve it to say, applications for membership shall be submitted in writing showing the full name, address, phone number, and email address of the applicant and accompanied by the appropriate dues. Personal checks or some form of electronic payment are acceptable. When an application has been duly filed, the applicant shall be deemed a member. Do I have approval of this change to our um, bylaws? All in favor? Aye. All right. And any opposed? Okay. The second thing is uh, we realized that we said it's an annual membership, but we didn't define what annual meant. Uh, so we are changing that line to say dues shall be payable annually January through December. Regardless of the time of the year a membership is started or ended, the full dues for that year are due. There shall be no pro rating. Do I have approval for this? Yes. Okay. Any dissent? Great. And the final one is uh, to update the language regarding terms of the trustees. 
Trustees shall be elected by the members of the annual meeting. The first term of a trustee shall last for one year. The board has the power to extend upon agreement of the members their term in order to ensure the continuity of leadership. Do I have approval for that? All right. And in light of that, that's what we're asking. We have uh, two candidates, William Carnes and Susan Gleason, who have agreed to extend their terms uh, one more year. So do we have anybody who would like to replace one of them? See, nobody ever steps up, right? <laughs> uh, do we have approval of extension of their terms? Yes. Okay, great. And I do want to thank them both for being willing to uh, to continue to do that. Uh, we are, however, still looking for a secretary. So if anybody would be interested in being joining the team and being secretary for the Crestwood Historical Society, please talk to me or to Conrad, our vice president, or to Chris Fryer, um, and we will... Um, or we can talk to Louise Glover, who was the secretary for 11 years. Um, and, and she didn't give it up because it was a terrible job and she hated working with people. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, if anybody is interested, please uh, talk to one of us. Um, Jackie uh, Leone, who is our treasurer, could not be here this morning, but she gave me what she called her treasurer's saga. Good morning, everyone. Pardon my absence. It's been a week. Please thoroughly read through the October 2023, October 2024 financial report, and there are copies of it on the uh, table. We have a small surplus because we hosted four exceptional programs, which cost us $650. Archive supplies were purchased for $200, and Natalie Barker's fee and the website fee were new additions to our expenses. I am currently in the process of solving the issues with online memberships, and that involves changing banks. That process alone involves an arduous paperwork due to getting a not-for-profit account through Chase. Uh, in addition to being treasurer, I am also working on uh, Crestwood Historical Society archival material, as well as those of this library. Um, and uh, perhaps it is fortuitous that we gather this month because Crestwood Library hosted their first exhibit to celebrate the 98th year of the dedication of the library. Some of the more relevant and interesting pieces are still on view in the cabinet upstairs and on the bookshelf near the fireplace. Mary Nowak is solely responsible for dressing up the exhibit. Her help was invaluable. And please do take a, a chance if you can afterwards. I know you're going up there really to, for the, um, the food, but uh, we invite you to look at the archival material at the same time. Um, in order to protect the photos and old papers, I decided to make color copies of some objects and in some cases chose to bring originals. Photos must be protected from UV light. With that in mind, I felt the need to purchase a permanent frame that could be used to put in different photos at different times. The frame that is currently holding Mrs. Helen Thompson Lyons picture was carefully chosen with the help of a man at Archival Methods, a company who was some of the best materials in the business. The last purchase of archival material was entirely paid for through the business office of Yonkers Public Library. Thank you, Vivian Prosetto. Moving forward, um, I will be taking a photograph preservation course in order to better preserve the photos. Conrad Youngren's photo album of Crestwood needs surgical assistance and kindness urgently, among other items in the collection. And to this end, the Crestwood Historical Society Board has approved doubling the amount of the budget for the archival material from the 2024 uh, budget to uh, the 2025 budget. Um, and she said, you can feel free to contact her here at the library uh, anytime for any questions. Um, and she hopes that you enjoyed the exhibit. The interns and I gathered the pieces in order to generate more interest in the historical roots of this Hamlet. It's no fun holding onto archives that will never see the light of day. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that is it. Um, I just want to, uh, I said at the beginning, we are going to have one more program. Uh, it's a co-sponsored program. You'll be getting a flyer in the mail, but you'll also be getting an e-blast. It's a film that's going to be held at the um, Will Library. It's on the Pound Ridge Massacre, and it will be followed by a Q&A with the director. Uh, so you'll be getting a notice of this uh, shortly. 
And now, Conrad Youngren, the Society's VP, will introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Karen. Uh, John Curran is the town historian of the city of Peekskill, which I guess makes him the city historian of the city of Peekskill, uh, and, uh, and has been a history buff for all his life. He, um, as a high school graduate, he was the History Award winner, which he shared that year with George Pataki. Uh, uh, he he uh, taught for many years in the U.S. and in Japan. Uh, when he returned, he, uh, he wrote for a number of uh, local newspapers on the, in the Westchester and the Mid-Hudson. He's become an expert in the history of, of that area. He's the author of uh, half a dozen books. Um, his most recent is a pictorial um, uh, description of the city of Peekskill. One of his uh, very interesting uh, works had to do with the uh, history of the African-American community in the Mid-Hudson area from uh, colonial days uh, forward. Um, I've known... Uh, I've known John uh, for a while, and back in uh, 2011, my wife Linda was reading an article in the local paper about a function that the uh, Peekskill Lincoln Society, of which John was at one time president, and the uh, Peekskill Museum, which John is the current vice president of, were um, we were sponsoring a uh, function at Hills, the Hillside Cemetery um, to commemorate the death of a uh, Peekskill native, one uh, Billy Patterson, who was killed at the Battle of Antietam. This was on the 150th anniversary of, uh, of that battle back in 2011. And Linda said to me, isn't that your relative? And I said, yeah, that's my grandmother's Uncle Billy. Um, so I, I called the museum and, uh, and they directed me to John and John invited me up to the, uh, to the site, which I was very familiar with. Not only is my great uncle Billy buried there, um, but his brother, my great grandfather, uh, their father, my great great grandfather, um, uh, Henry, Billy's brother's uh, 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 six daughters, including my grandmother, is buried there, and my parents are buried there. So um, going to Peekskill meant a couple of things to us, depending on the length of stay. <clears throat> but uh, I would like to uh, like to welcome uh, uh, John. He's uh, I've I haven't heard this particular. Um, uh, talk. I, we're, I'm a member of the Peekskill Museum. I've been there for a number of functions. I've heard John give a number of talks. Uh, he gave this one about six months ago. I, I didn't make that, so I'm anxious to hear about this young man that became an old man that uh, served in the Revolutionary War. So please welcome John Curran. I'm going to get right into it because this is really uh, an important and fascinating topic that uh, among the, well, actually many, uh, you know, memoirs of Revolutionary War, uh, I'm going to focus on one in particular. And um, the interesting thing is that this one individual uh, fought through the entire war from 1776 up through 1783. He uh, was a foot soldier. He uh, was a private in the revolutionary um, campaign. Okay, this is the book, and it has several editions. One is known as Private Yankee Doodle, and the other is a narrative of the uh, adventures and dangers and sufferings of a revolutionary soldier. And um, now the deal is on the original uh, title page, he uh, the man did not include his name. He just he put there written by himself. So there was a mystery for a long time who wrote this memoir. And it was almost 150 years later that it was rediscovered. And so it's almost like a new thing to us to get this amount of detail 
from one person at that time of all the things that were going on. The title is, as you can see over here, a narrative of some of the adventures, dangers, and sufferings of a revolutionary soldier interspersed with anecdotes of incidents that occurred with his own, within his own observation. The name of the author and the soldier, uh, we now, well, well, his name was Joseph Plum Martin. But the interesting thing is the, the middle name Plum was not really a middle name. Uh, his father's family name was Martin. His mother's family name was Plum. I think it may be a New England thing. So when he wrote his name out, it was Joseph Plum Martin, sort of like that, kind of interesting. He was born in Western Massachusetts. His father was a Protestant minister who studied at Yale College. That explains the literacy when he was growing up. His mother was a member of a farm family in Western Connecticut. So we have to begin where he was, and that was in 1775, when fighting broke out at Lexington and Concord in Massachusetts. And he records his reaction to those events when he was like 15 years old. He said the British were spreading death and desolation in their route in every direction. It caused me terrible fright. During the winter of 1775-76, by hearing the conversation and disputes of the good old former politicians of the times, well, I'm still on the intro, but I can do it. Okay. And uh, I didn't get to 76 yet. I'll okay. interview. He said, uh, I was as warm a patriot as the rest of them. Soldiers were at that time enlisting for a year's service. They were to go to New York. So 16-year-old Joseph Martin enlisted in a Connecticut militia regiment for six months. And he signed up on July 6, 1776. Okay, now we can go to the next, if I do it right. I believe I hit the arrow and it didn't go. And that is the fighting in New York. And the, uh, oh, okay, we'll skip over that. Go to the third one. Yeah. Ah, there we go. An hour in 1776, he's in the army and a militia regiment, and he's immediately sent because the fighting is over in the, in Boston, Massachusetts. By the way, the, uh, the the entire British Army and Navy vacated Boston, and where did they go? They went into New York Harbor. They landed on Staten Island, and they came with 130 ships, 32,000 soldiers, and 1,000 cannon. Uh, they were going to take over. They wanted. They lost Massachusetts. They wanted to hold on to to this area, this uh, region, New York uh, place, all, all of it. And um, so what happened was George Washington. He was up in in Boston. He took all his forces, and then he tried to arrive before the British uh, came down, and that's what he did. The Americans had control of Manhattan and you know, Westchester in the Bronx and some, some parts of Brooklyn. So what did the British do? Within a month from June 76, they attack Long Island and it leads to several sequence of, of, of skirmishes and battles. And guess who's on the scene? That's our soldier. And this is what he says. You can see on the map there on, the, on the, your right, uh, some of the details of what we're talking about. So, uh, Joseph Martin writes, I went to the top of the house where I had a full view. I distinctly saw the smoke of the field artillery. The horrors of battles then presented themselves to my mind in all their hideousness. We now began to meet wounded men. We had eight or 10 of our regiment killed in the action and a number wounded. I endeavored to do my duty as well as I am able and leave the event to providence. Uh, we're going to come back to that later, the word providence. I hope some of you or, or most of you already know what that is. It's some kind of spiritual guiding and protective force. And uh, we'll, I'll get into that a little bit later. So what happens is the, the British uh, do push the Americans out of uh, Long Island, and there's fighting up through Manhattan. There's, there's a, fi a fighting at Kipps Bay, 
There's fighting at Harlem Heights. And eventually the British do push the American forces, except for Fort Washington, all the way out of Manhattan, up through Lower Westchester. And guess where they're pushing towards? They're pushing towards White Plains. And that's where the Americans decide to stop, turn around, and stand up and face this British uh, force coming at them. Guess who's on the scene? Joe Martin. We marched for White Plains in the night. I was so beat out before morning with hunger and fatigue that I could hardly move one foot in front of another. We arrived at White Plains just at the dawn of day, tired and faint. We soon found the British were advancing upon us. Before we were ready, the battle had begun. And then it did begin. Actually, the Battle of White Plains was a significant military event. It lasted almost for a whole week. It was, you know, they had the lines and the lines, and, and basically they battered and counterattacked and so on, weren't getting anywhere. And, um, well, first of all, Martin, that's my words, this is Martin words. When forced to retreat, we lost and killed and wounded a considerable number. I had nothing to eat or drink, not even water because they don't have time for that. And who's, who was supposed to be giving them supplies? You know, this, this was an army on the move. And after that, uh, the British decided it wasn't to, to their advantage to keep doing this. So basically they retreated down, uh, well, mostly to Manhattan and a little bit in the, in the Bronx area. So what happened to the Americans? What do they do? Well, they retreated as well. And they went north and they went directly to Peekskill. And Peekskill became the main headquarters and base camp and supply depot uh, for the American army for most of the rest of the war. And Joe Martin goes there as well. Uh, oh, there, just a little bit about why that's so important to have, a, a you know, specifically Peekskill as the headquarters and base camp and supply and all of that, because Already beginning in 75, George Washington figured out this was an important area that needed to be defended. And so there were six forts in place in 1776, if I can remember them correctly. There's one at Stony Point. There's one at Verplanks Point called Fort, called Fort Lafayette. Uh, further up, there's Fort Independence. That's right in the Peekskill Bay. You go up north a little bit more. There's Fort Clinton and Montgomery. Then you go further up. And there's West Point and, and a little bit of Constitution on that was the protective barrier for the river and to, you know to keep the British uh, you know uh, within their own zone of where they could go and uh, well what happens is that the British realize this they they can't go this way and they can't go that way so where do they go they go to west through New Jersey and they're going into Pennsylvania they want to attack. Philadelphia. Okay. And um, so Joe Martin, he's with the American force as they withdraw from White Plains. He comes directly to Peekskill. Remember, he only signed up for six months because you know, he's in a militia regiment. So he says, I arrived at camp with the rest where we, where we remained moving from place to place at occasion required, undergoing hunger, cold, and fatigue until the 25th of December, 1776. I was discharged from my term of service. Here ends my first campaign. Now the book that, that Martin wrote, the memoir, is very clear. He delineates what happens in each year, 76, 77, and, he, and, it, and that's what we're going through right now. So it's really a very fascinating narrative. Um, so he goes back to Connecticut for the winter. And then what happens? Well, the British decide, okay, the, the Americans think they're so smart that we can't get through uh, the barriers that they created, you know, going up to Hudson. And where's the center of activity? Uh, well, I guess it's Peekskill. So what do they do? As soon as the river actually froze over many times, apparently during the 1700s, the so late 1700s, as soon as the river is free of ice, the British bring a warship and several support vessels, 500 infantry, and they attack Peekskill directly. 
And they use the naval and the infantry at the same time. Also, they bring artillery. And they blast the American camp, which is uh, technically known as, as Fort Hill. There were several American barracks buildings there. And also along the bay and the dock, there were supplies and warehouses, you know, for the rest of the soldiers and the other forts. And that's what the British were after. They succeeded. They chased the Americans away from their uh, positions there in Peekskill. On the other, on the, well, I don't get into too much detail. I wrote a whole book about this thing. So I have to just keep it moving. Uh, the Americans withdrew. They went up to Continental Village and, and sort of stood there. And, uh, and the British caused considerable destruction. There was so much uh, uh, physical supplies that they destroyed, and they were so proud of what they did. It was listed in two, three British newspapers uh, within a week or so. You know, a big rate of picture. We did this, we got this, we got that. You know, they wrecked the boats, they burned the warehouses, um, and a lot of damage. Um, so that's what they were about. So Joseph Martin, he's home, he's back in Connecticut. He joins up right away. And this time he joins a, a Continental Army regiment. And the term of service for the Continental Army was either three years or the duration of the campaign. And um, let's see where we are here. We're in 77. So anyway, he joins uh, the regiment of uh, Colonel John Chandler. And Chandler and Martin are sent immediately to Big School to defend it against further you know, invasion from the British. And uh, what he, he, okay, Joseph Martin spends most of his time in Hudson Valley and a lot of it in Westchester. Uh, so what they do is, um, so, okay, Joe Martin is here with his Connecticut regiment. They're here for in that place for about six months. And what they do is uh, they go on scouting patrols a lot down through Westchester County. Because, you know, there, there's a lot of confusion in the county, as you well know, at that time. Because you have the Tories, you know, the families that side with the British. They have the Americans. So a lot of people are caught in the middle. And then you have these two genuine military forces pushing from both sides. And so it's, a, it's chaos, a lot of it. It's very dangerous. They're burning houses and killing cattle and all this kind of stuff. So that's what Joe Martin and his regiment is doing there. They're forming a protective line as much as possible, which is probably moving back and forth all the time. Um, but the Peekskill Museum has the actual original uh, regimental report of this regiment in 1777 because they were they camped there for so long. And we even found Joe Martin's company, who, you know, the, the, which one he was part of at that time. Uh, while they're camped there, this is uh, not incidental, but a very important thing, because this is an army, they're on the move, and uh, there's a lot of dangers, including disease. But what happens? Smallpox hits the army. And George Washington is, is well, he's sort of freaked out. He's very concerned about this. Uh, because in, Mass in Massachusetts, they lost more soldiers from, from disease often than in the battle. So Washington, this is like a new thing, but there was an inoculation for smallpox, and he orders all the soldiers to be inoculated there in that in that area of of, uh, of uh, Westchester and uh, Hudson Valley. And Martin says, I was sort of ordered, ordered off in a company with about 400 others to a set of old barracks a mile or two in the highlands to be inoculated with smallpox. Now, he did that, and he survived. He didn't have any really effects from that. Apparently, the survival rate, because, you know, sometimes, you know, they put the live uh, uh, a germ right in, in your body, and that, as you know, that becomes the, uh, the protective uh, vaccination. So uh, to explain just a little bit of detail what he does, you know, his role, his job, his regiment, what he's done. He says, um, so now he's pushing the lines in, in Westchester County. He writes this. We arrived on the lines and joined the other corps already there. No one who has never been on such duty as those advanced parties have to perform 
have an adequate idea of the trouble, fatigue, and dangers which they have to encounter. And so there you go. There he is. The, uh, so this is when uh, George Washington and his forces, he takes about 10,000 soldiers from Peekskill, leaves about 3,000 in the highlands, and he tries to follow the British, maybe get there before the, the British get to Pennsylvania. And um, so uh, Joe Martin is now in the continent, and he's, go, he's with that force. And um, this is what he says. And he repeats it over and over for a full eight years, by the way. Starvation seemed to be entailed upon the army and every animal connected with it. Our constant companions were fatigue, cold, and hunger. The army was not only starved, but naked. I don't know about naked, but in other words, they didn't really, they weren't resupplied with winter clothing and, and things that they needed at that time. We had hard duty to perform and little or no strength to perform it with. So there's a stalemate. The British actually do take Philadelphia. And Washington has to go into his winter headquarters. Guess what? Where do they go? They go to Valley Forge. So we, this is Martin. We arrived at Valley Forge in the evening. It was dark. There was no water to be found. Fatigue and thirst joined with hunger almost made me desperate. I lay there two nights and one day and had not a, <laughs> maybe it's not lighting, had a, not a morsel of anything to eat the whole time, save a small pumpkin. I mean, what great detail. I mean, this is a guy on the scene and he, he wrote all this from memory, by the way, when he was 70 years old. And, uh, and this was uh, the first edition of the book. You see, there were several editions. Um, uh, of the book. Uh, the first one that came out uh, called Private uh, Yankee Doodle has, was edited by the man that found the manuscript and he fills in all the details uh, of that type of thing. Let's see if I'm in the right place. Yes, here we are. This is the Hudson Valley. This is 1777. And you can see what, what I was talking about. This is starting point. This is um, replaced with. This is Beachfield. This is Fort Independence. This is Fort uh, Clinton. This is Fort Montgomery. And uh, that's it. This was the barrier, you know, to, to keep the British out of there. It's a great map. Detail. Okay, the winter of uh, 77, 78, that was the Valley Forge experience. Uh, it, was, it was a terrible thing, and they did uh, endure things that they shouldn't have to endure, but they had no choice. And... Um, so often, actually, his his group, his squad, his regiment, Martin, uh, was sent on what they call foraging expeditions. In other words, you you guys go out there, you know, look at the farm, see what's going on. We need more supplies, and they usually they would ask, you know, can we need more of whatever you may can afford to give us, uh, you know, some kind of food or animals or whatever it might be. So he did uh, several expeditions on that. And he had some small adventures that he talks about in the book, meeting different kinds of people. Um, what he finds is the most friendly were the Quakers. The Quakers were pacifist and indifferent for the most part, and they were just being helpful. But he makes a note of that, which is kind of interesting. Also, and in, now we're in the, in the early spring of 78, and uh, there's a new officer that arrives on the scene from Europe. He calls himself Baron von Steuben. I don't know what his first name was. <laughs> Maybe Baron was his first name, as far as I know. But he uh, was from the Prussian experience of military in Germany. And he, he really does shape the army together, uh, you know, about drilling and, had, you know, tactics and how to follow in a line or not a line and how to turn around and things like that. So Joe Martin says, 
we learned Baron von Steuben's new Prussian exercise. It was continual drill. About this time, I was sent off from camp with a detachment of about 300 men and four field pieces under the command of General Lafayette. Interesting also, General Lafayette is on the scene, you know, an officer, another officer from uh, Europe. This was really an international uh, war in many, in many uh, dimensions, by the way. So uh, the British, for some reason, well, they have Philadelphia was not doing them any advantage. So they decide to leave Philadelphia. And as they're leaving, they're going up from Pennsylvania through New Jersey. So what happens then? Well, the American forces follow behind and, and they, they attack the rear columns of the, of the British. And that turns into the Battle of Monmouth, Monmouth, New Jersey, which was, you know, a lot of fighting, a lot of bad stuff happened there. And uh, so Joe Martin writes, we march immediately in pursuit. And what the British would do, yes, they're leaving, but then they would they would stop, turn around, and then fire back. It was it was a real war. It was bad, and that was a bad battle uh, for both sides, really. Um, so the British go back to New York City, and the Americans go back to the Hudson Valley. And uh, his force, his regiment, is down to Tarrantown and White Plains. And while he's in Dagger, he's transferred to what's called the Light Infantry. Now the, now, the light infantry, infantry uh, means that you go in small groups and you're able to engage the enemy at will, wherever you see something needs to be done. So you're more trusted as a soldier than the regular. So that's Joe Martin. He's in the light infantry as well. And he's on the advanced line almost all the time. He says about that, uh, we lay at White Plains for some time. I had hard duty to perform during the remainder of the campaign. There were, well, he says R in the present tense. There are three regiments of light infantry composed of men from the whole main army. It was a motley group composed of Yankees, Irishmen, Buckskins, and whatnot. So interesting detail, you know, who the Americans were, you know, many different kinds of people. The duty of the light infantry is the hardest. When the lines near the enemy, when on the lines near the enemy, we're always on alert, constantly on the watch. And he goes in the, in the book, a lot of details about that, a lot of things that go on. Um, so, and then the, the time goes by, Monmouth, I think happened in, uh, um, anyway, it's winter, the next winter comes along and now the Americans winter at Morristown. And he writes there, I assisted in building the winter huts. We moved into them about New Year's Day. And as I have got into winter headquarters again, I will here bring my third campaign to a close. So now, oh, that was 78. Now we move into 1779. That gen, oh, thank you. I guess so. Oh, that was the attack of Peekskill. I, I need to go over here a little bit. Oh, this is my book. I did a whole uh, uh, 100 pages or so book uh, uh, about that particular attack, helped by the resources of West Point. Uh, Colonel Johnson, who was the Hudson Valley military historian, gave me a lot of documents. And um, we got some from the Library of Congress, and I put it in the book. We found this battle, which is really amazing, the detail. Uh, this was the general in charge at that time. Alexander McDougall, and uh, McDougall is over here with the Americans. These are the barracks. This they have a readout in the overlook here. These are the rebels, the rebels of the Americans. And over here are the King's troops. The King's troops came up this way and blasted at them. They withdrew. It's great detail and strong man. You know, just the detail of the actors is really amazing. So I won't be on that, actually. <laughs> so I think now we're in 78. What's going on in 79? Okay, this is, uh, it's a great graphic uh, of, of the, uh, the assortment of people, you know, men and old, uh, uh, you know, uh, clad as best they can be. 
representing that's a you know a, a, um, what's the type of uh, image that's uh, just uh, epitome of uh, and what's going on at that time, and they're very determined and they were the whole time. So, so this is the winter of 1779. Uh, the army is uh, camped at uh, at the Morristown, and it was a very bad winter. And the the men on the ground are becoming a little bit uh, uncomfortable with their situation. This is the winter that hasn't hasn't has not improved much from Valley Forge, and it begins they begin uh, showing resistance. Uh, to the officers. There was a passive mutiny against officers in 1779. The, they would be called out for review, and the officers would say, do this and do that, and they just stood there. And um, this is Joe Martin's words, what's going on, why we did that. He said, we concluded that we could not and, uh, and would not bear it any longer. We endeavored to bear it with our usual fortitude until it again became unbearable. It was so bad that uh, Washington was concerned. He says, this, this is, well, I don't, I, the wording is exact, but it was very, this is the most important thing he says that has happened. He, he gave them all furloughs and let them go home for a while. Um, that basically that's what happened. And after that, after the winter, you know, melts away a little bit, uh, they come back to the Hudson Valley and they, you know, the, all those defensive areas. 1779, because, you know, the British know that the Americans are still there and we can't get through there. They attack again in Hudson Valley. In 1779, they attack Stony Point, July, and they come up from the back and they take it. And then they go around the other side and they take Fort Lafayette, and they occupy that. And that's a very dangerous uh, thing for the Americans. The, um, okay, this is Martin's words. Uh, uh, in the night, we heard the cannon. Well, okay, he sent down just around uh, the British at the Plains Point, and uh, it was occupied by a captain and a hundred men. Uh, the British took them all prisoner, and uh, they took the place by cannon fire and land and circled them. And then they made a garrison of the prisoners, and so on and so on. On July 15, 1779, Martin writes, In the night, we heard the cannon at Stony Point, and early, early next morning, had information of the taking of that place by the light infantry of our army under the command of General Wayne. That's Anthony Wayne. He takes uh, Stony Point from the British. And uh, for Plank was the word. And, and accordingly, we set off full tilt to take for Plank's point. Martin is right there. He, he's every activity that's going on, it seems his regiment is in the middle of it. So the British again leave the Hudson Valley. They go back to New York City. And um, so Martin is, is on the ground in the Hudson Valley. He says, a large detachment of which I was one was sent to Verplank's Point to level the British works. We were occupied in this business nearly two weeks, working and starving by day and at night having to lie in the woods without tents. There's still no supplies. Oh, that's me saying. That. And here I will close the narrative of my campaign of 1779. Happy should I then have thought myself if I had ended the war, if that had ended the war, but I had to see a little more trouble before that period arrives. Believe it or not, despite everything, we've been, there's four more years of the war. I'm trying to go, this is the condensed version, by the way. So 1778, 1778. I'm trying to get to the highlights of this. Let's see where we are here. Yes. Okay. I, I did some of this on 79. And now basically roll. Joe Martin is patrolling with his uh, regiment in the Hudson Valley. A lot of it in Westchester. And he's, he's uh, uh, on patrol 
Oh, one more thing. I, I, I went over this. I almost, uh, well, before that happens, he goes on patrol. They, they're still in the winter of 79, 80. He talks about this winter, winter of 1779. It was so severe. This has been denominated the hard winter. It was hard for the army in particular in more respects than one. This part, this period of the revolution has been repeated, repeatedly styled as the times that tried men's souls. Thomas Paine, this is when he writes that. This is very, very bad. They're not really getting it. Yeah, we go here, we go there, we go there. And it's, it's, it seems to be the same thing over and over again. He says, I found that those times not only tried men's souls, but their bodies too. I know, I, I know they did mine. And that effectually, and that effectually during a spell of remarkable cold weather. And apparently there were several storms, some of them four feet high. Imagine that in a couple of weeks. Or... It's, it's, that's the way it was. For several days after we rejoined the army, we got a little musty bread and a little beef about every other day when, when we then got nothing at all. The men were now exasperated beyond endurance. They could not stand it any longer. They saw no other alternative than to starve or break up the army, give it up and go, go home. See, the, he reveals the desperation in the American army at particular points. But he says, they were truly patriotic. They loved their country and they had already suffered and everything short of death in its cause, what was to be done? Again, this is, a, this is a crisis point. At evening roll call, they began to show their dissatisfaction by snapping at the officers and acting contrary to their orders. Actually, this was a, a, a version of a mutiny. And that's, that's the facts of, of what happened there. That's how desperate the situation was. Okay, let's see where we are. Well, that's where he goes back to the uh, the Benson and we're in 1780, and uh, Joe Martin and his regiment is patrolling, as I mentioned before, uh, this area of the county. And uh, that's the year when the Benedict Arnold, John Andre event takes place, and Joe Martin claims he saw the Volker going up the river. He was in Dom's Ferry at that time. And uh, and then uh, um, um, Andre is captured at Terrytown, and then he's taken to Japan. There's a trial, and he's executed. Guess who's there on the scene? Our man Joseph Martin. I mean the soldier. And he says this. He says, uh, "I saw Andre before his execution, but I was on duty that day and could not attend. Otherwise, I should." In other words, he would. He would want to see it. He was but a man, but no, but no better than our brave captain Nathan Hale, with whom the British caused whom the British caused to be executed as a spy in 1776 without the shadow of a trial, denying him the use of a Bible or the assistance of a clergyman in his last moment, and destroying the letters he had written to his widowed mother and other relations. That's how the British treated the man that they accused of being a spy in Manhattan. That was Nathan Hale. Andre had every indulgence that could be granted under the conditions. See the contrast, he says, that all who pity Andre so much look at it and be silent. Even then he realized, you know, there's some kind of sympathy for Andre. And Martin did not share that, that feeling. Okay, well, finally we get to 1781, and actually one of the most dramatic battles happens uh, in this year. Uh, Martin, at this time, he's stationed at West Point. West Point is being built up more and more as a defensive area, and also, you know, barracks and uh, and the chain also going across there. And then in the springtime, he goes down. Oh, this is what he says: We and the rest of the Army of the Highlands 
moved down and it camped at Pinksfield. That's usually what they would do, come there first and then go somewhere else. We remained here a while, then moved down about 15 miles from New York. The next morning, we were joined by the French army from Rhode Island. So this is the meeting of the two armies, the American and the French, right in this area. And the initial plan, George Washington's idea, was to press against New York and maybe with the French support, actually take New York or push the British out of, out of New York. Um, but some people think it was just a feint. In other words, just a, a pretend attack. So while they're doing that, the, the Americans are pushing against the lines in Westchester County, acting as if they want to get through, down through the Bronx, down to New York City. Washington sends his army, both the French and the Americans, cross the river at uh, uh, Verplank's Point, and uh, they go down uh, through the states of um, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and they wind up in Virginia. Uh, and that's where the, the British have uh, uh, had another force at uh, Yorktown, uh, led by, um, anyway, it's surrounded. I better stick to my my own narrative here. And um, okay, the next morning we were joined by the French army from Rhode Island. Uh, here we uh, from this is here we each received a month's a month's pay from officers of the French army. This was the first that could be called money that we received as wages since the war, seventeen seventy six since the war began, or that we ever did receive till the close of the war. By the way, when you, someone joined the Continental Army, uh, you were promised certain things. You were supposed to get a pay of $6 a month. They never got it. That's, that was the controversy at the end of the war. They wanted back pay. Some got it and some didn't. But he goes into great detail at the end of the book at all, about all that detail. So anyway, here he goes, Joe Martin, his regiment goes uh, down to Virginia with the rest of the, most of the American army and they surround, there you go. Uh, Conrad had, was able to get this uh, battle map of the Battle of Yorktown. Here are the British here, you know, they have the war here and they're the defensive lines. These are the American forces surrounding. Basically the British are trapped what the Americans do is they push up, push up, push up with cannons and so on. And the British are losing forces and probably getting resupplied. Uh, so eventually they quit. They stop, they give up, they surrender. And this graphic here shows the meeting of the, of the officers of the two armies where they will where surrender. Okay, Joe Martin is on the scene as this is going on. Uh, he's in he's in a direct uh, a line of battle as they're pushing against the uh, the English, and uh, okay, this is what he says: We made preparations for laying close siege to the enemy. Uh, the Americans and the French had about a hundred mortars, and uh, they were all let loose at the same time. That was the signal for raising the flag. About noon, the whole of the batteries began the bombardment by hoisting the American flag. I felt, I, I, I confess, I felt a secret pride when I saw, uh, so, uh, oh, I, okay, the point is that, that was a signal to attack, raising the American flag, the uh, Star Spangled Banner. And it was it just rallied all the Americans. And they just go over now, they're in the bayonet charge, and he's there with them. And the British, that's when they give up. You know, the, the British are, you know, the, they have no supplies left for their own anymore, really. The word was up, up, repeated through the detachment. The fort was taken in a short time. Seven or eight of our regiment were killed and a number wounded. In October 17th, General Cornwallis asked for a cessation, a stop to the fighting. And on the 19th, we were marched onto the ground and parading on the right side of the road and the French forces on the left. You know, uh, some of the detail of that, 
where the uh, French form, you know, on one side, the Americans, and the British marched through the middle without their weapons. Very dramatic. And that's, that's some of the graphics that you see over there. So after this, uh, Joe Martin, his regiment, and the rest of the army, they march, march, they walk <laughs> back up through the states from Virginia, through Pennsylvania, through New Jersey, and they all come back to the Hudson Valley again. And that's where we are. Now, luckily, in 1772, there's a not, not a lot going on because essentially the British know they lost. And so it's like a lull time. They haven't, they haven't conceded. They haven't say, you know, we quit yet. But, it, but nothing really goes on in, the, in 1782 of any military importance. And, um, and uh, Joe Martin winds up at West Point. And that's where he helps to, again, build more barracks up there. If, you, if you've ever been into Windsor, you know, the barracks are still there. And they're very impressive buildings. You know, for the winters were very severe. And you know, they needed to have chimneys and, and, and good walls and all this type of thing. Uh, unfortunately, just a little detail, because you can never really shake free of all the dangers. Uh, yellow fever shows up in the camps. <laughs> and it's transmitted by mosquitoes. He did get the disease, and it was he suffered considerably from it for some time. He did survive. He did have a shoulder wound. Um, I'm not exactly sure how, but he did. Uh, it did heal. Uh, also, they, they they had doctors in the army, in the American army, but it was it was better than nothing. You know, they did the best they could. Seventeen. Okay, we're we're now in. Oh yeah. Okay. Let's move along. We're, we're in, from, from 82, we're now in 83, 1783. And Joseph Martin's regiment is stationed at, at West Point. And their duty is to, to take care of the great chain, the great chain across the river from West Point to Fort Con to Constitution Island, Fort Constitution. And guess what his job is? That's his job. They have a what they call a windlass. In other words, it's a big barrel thing that you turn like this. And that's how they hauled in the chain in the, uh, they had taken in for the winter and put it out in the springtime. Apparently he had done that several times. So he mentions that the soldiers nicknamed this George Washington's watch chain. Now we heard nothing about it being put out this spring. The putting down or keeping up of the chain was the criterion by which we have to judge war or peace. In April, we had general orders that the war was over. The prize was won, for which we had been contending through eight tedious years. And uh, interesting there, he's Joe Martin, of all the people, who <laughs> wrote the best memoir that, that has been found of all the details of a foot soldier uh, in the Revolutionary War, uh, has that, that kind of detail. Um, so he's discharged in 1783 at West Point. And what happens is, okay, you guys, you did your service, honorable discharge, and uh, hello, goodbye. Basically, these guys are on the road again. Now they're promised, the Congress promised them land if they survived the war. And so the, yes, they were offered land. Where was the land? In Ohio. So they had no way to get out there. They still had no money. And so what they would do is they would sell it at discount. There's a, some interesting detail about that, as you know. The percentage, he got a percentage of the value of the land. So at least he had some money. What he did from West Point, by the way, the winter was coming up again. He was in Fishkill a little time. They asked him to teach school over at Newport, which he did because he was very literate, obviously. And so he did that. And after he did that uh, year, he went back to New England. Actually, he went to the state of Maine. And why did he go there? Because land was cheap. So he did have a little money from being in the army. And that's where he remained the rest of his life. He uh, was respected in the town that he was in. And they gave him a, a job as a clerk in some small community up there. So he was able to support himself. He had a family. He... Uh, he married, and uh, this is when they're both very elderly. Uh, that's Joe Martin on your right, 
that's his wife. They had six children. And uh, so when he's 70 years old. And people are saying the reason he writes the memoir is that so he, they, the people in the community know he went through the war. So they keep coming to him. Well, how, what was it like in the war? You know, the younger people. He says, you know, I'm tired of answering all these things. So I wrote, I'm going to write the book. <laughs> that's what he said. That, that's how the book came about. And um, he lived another 10 years and he died when he was 80. So uh, that's another interesting landmark. Um, oh, he, this is what he says again, that I survived the war was totally due to providence. Providence. What does George Washington say at the end of the war? Very interesting statement he makes. He says, um, the, uh, excuse my uh, voice a little bit, the unparalleled perseverance of the armies of the United States through, through almost every possible suffering and discouragement for the space of eight long years was little short of a standing miracle, George Washington. Uh, Martin uh, shares that, that opinion, that extent, by the way. Let's see if I have anything else on this. Um, Bear with me I'm just a little bit more. It occurred to me in reading this, this is an ordeal. I mean, this, this guy, and it's not just him. I mean, the thousands, hundreds went through this experience. Why? Why would they go through all of that? Well, first of all, when you join up, uh, they promise you some money. They give you a barrel head money. In other words, here's a gold coin on the barrel head. If you pick up the coin, you just join the army. That's how it worked up in New England. Uh, and you were also promised six dollars a month for privates. And as you went up the line, the officers they got prom promised more pay, but they they never really got it. They were promised suitable clothing. They were promised a regular diet. They didn't get either one of those. Um, so why did he join? Well, first of all, first of all, he's a teenager. His friends are joining him, and he had a sense of adventure. That's another reason. Also, he believed in what they call the cause of liberty and independence as the right things to have. They're, they're very convinced of that. And, and so when you see it from his point of view, you get a better understanding of it, why they would risk all, all of these things, including their lives, to go through such or, an ordeal. But also, they thought the war would be over in three years. Right? Eight years was the was a long one. And uh, also, the, the, the main thing that, that Martin says over again, that we felt loyalty to the country that we helped create. And so that was really the, the, the driving picture on it, the um, force of the whole thing. Let's see if there's anything left here. Oh, I went the wrong way. Oh, okay. Uh, just a couple more minutes on this. Uh, this, uh, because Big School was so important in the Revolutionary War, uh, a librarian, the Big School librarian, Emma Patterson, wrote this book way back in the 1950s. Great detail, because she covers each year as well what happened in Peekskill at that time. Uh, near Peekskill, there are many uh, revolutionary veterans buried up in Van Cortlandville at the so-called St. Peter's Cemetery. And this was the old St. Peter's Church, was used by the French and the Americans as a hospital uh, during the war. And, and many of the veterans are there. This is the grave site of John Jones, uh, who died. Um, I can't read all the details here, but you see he's a Revolutionary War veteran. And uh, just to be fair about this whole thing, there were some women soldiers in American art. This is one in particular. Her name was Deborah Sampson. And she's looking pretty good here, but during the war, she pretended to be a man who got away with it. For three years, she was in the office for three years. She got a painting of it. She, she was wounded twice, and there's a statue of her in Sharon, Connecticut. It's out in front of the library in Sharon, Connecticut. So there's so many things to this whole thing that was so interesting. And um, 
basically, that's it. So, so long, folks. One more what? I'm sorry? There is? Was my picture on? Oh, oh, oh you know, I, when I was sitting over there listening to the meeting uh, led by your president, it occurred to me, wow, <laughs> you did exactly the same thing we do at the Big School Museum. I've been there since 1986. And you, we have these meetings, we have annual meetings, we have monthly meetings. It's exactly the same. It's almost the same wording. You know, we're going to revise the Constitution, but how are we going to do this and how are we going to do that? But it's something I think is worth doing because uh, I think the history is valuable. And so you are dedicating your time and your energies and your talents to all of this type of thing, which is, which is fine. And we had actors up in Peekskill. Uh, when Jim Johnson was uh, in the area, uh, he, was part, he became a reenactor in several different places. And you see in the bottom there, that's the fifth New York. And they were at uh, Fort uh, uh, Montgomery when it was attacked. And on, okay, I don't want to do too much, but the, the Big Steel Museum has artifacts from the war. And that's what you see on the top there. And so we have the real things, you know, we have the rifles, we have the bayonets, we have the powder horns, we have some parts of a uniform. And on the very right there, that's the handwritten uh, report of Joe, Joe Martin's regiment, Colonel Chandler's regiment. And that's original. It's really amazing to have that. Let's see if there's anything else. It all goes black. <laughs> it, it doesn't go back to a picture. But, but I understand you're willing to take questions. Yes. Well, I'm sure, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Have that, uh, thing of Eric was educated at George Washington. He is buried in Randolph, Maine, which is across the Kennebec River from Gardner, Maine, which is about six miles outside of Augusta. And also, I have a um, what was his name? Nathaniel Perry, P E R R Y. Mm -hmm. And we have documentation. And also, my ancestor Lydia Perry was also the first white child as opposed to the indigenous people to be born in the uh, Massachusetts Commonwealth, which was Maine. Well, they settled the name, but Maine was Massachusetts at that time. Hmm, interesting. <laughs> so you, you remember the DAR, I presume? My uh, my uh, nieces, I could be. But... Oh, okay, because they yeah. want real documentation. Oh, it's documentation. Well, that's interesting. Descendants of you know. Yes, sir. Seventh graders in the Peter Small School in the Woodward Seventh and Mount Vernon. I I told them what I did about. Wait, why don't you? Say it in here. I shouldn't pass this to you. Because I, I, I was telling me the 7th graders who I taught at Davis Middle School in the Cleveland section of the room that if uh, Colonel John Glover had not slowed down Cornwallis in his flank maneuver at uh, Battle of Bell Point and had Cornwallis gotten to with the location where Davis School is in the heights of northwestern Mount Vernon. His artillery would have been able to intercept the line of retreat of Joseph Tom Martin and the rest of the Continental Army retreating towards my flanks. Was I lying to those kids, or from the best of your knowledge, was the line of retreat in that area basically through the uh, Rock Hill Valley? Uh, yes, absolutely. I did. <laughs> uh, the American Army was on the run. And they tried to stay together as much as possible, I presume. But also, they needed a what, what do you call it? The back force that's that's uh, protecting the column, rear guard. So all those things happened. By the way, you mentioned Glover. He was very important with the evacuation from uh, Long Island into Manhattan. He was because he had the boats. They left in the in the night. By the way, and it was Glover that really uh, supervised that whole thing. Uh, I, I read his memoir, his his letters, great detail in there. But we'll never know exactly, you know, exactly everything that happened. Um, but it's interesting that that you know that and you're teaching that. That's it's really good. Just up the road here, we have Old Road, there's Old Army Road. I figured that was used by the Army. 
constantly used by bulldozers, no doubt. This this area was sometimes British. Yeah, he was a light, what they call light infantry, like a scout, you know, things like that. What light infantry was devised by Colonel Gates during the French Indian War, and he basically copied the organization and the method of driving rangers. Uh, the established, uh, the British Army. We just the way that General Gates did. Great detail. Yeah, Rogers Rangers, that's the story in itself. You know, they, they took on the, on the mode of Indian fighting. And that's how they were so successful. But we're going backwards there, that's when Indian works. Northwest Passage by Kenneth Well, it's a great movie, too. Yeah, the, who stars in that? I forget. Um, it's yeah. yeah, it's a very gritty story with the war. Yeah, the war was gritty. Yeah. Okay, anything else? You asked me to announce that tomorrow there's a program at the, at the North Shelf Library at 2 o'clock uh, Patriots and, uh, and Loyalists, a series of monologues about what's up there during the, uh, during the revolution. And she she basically drafted me to write a monologue on Daniel Linham. So that's uh, 2 o'clock from about 3.30 at the uh, Okay. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming. I, I do also want to push one more exhibition uh, because I helped to install it. I didn't do it, but I helped my friend install it. It's up in Greenwich, and it's called Greenwich in the American Revolution, a frontier town on the front line. And it looks at the war from the point of view of the people who were living in Greenwich at that time. Um, and so in many ways, it's a, a variation of a diary um, as much as, uh, as could be. They also have two documents, one of which is a paycheck for a soldier that said, you are going to be paid whatever it was. And, but, and we promised to pay this within 10 years. It was, I mean, it was just, it was too much. I, I would ask kids, so do you think you would work for a company where they said, well, we'll pay you this, but, and we promise we'll pay it before 10 years. Uh, no, I don't think that. And they also have a document where they were getting people to soldiers to sign up and you had to bring your own gun. You had to bring your own backpack. You had to bring the thing that you would carry your bullets in and you had to bring the blanket, all of which you would be paid for. Do you know which got the most money? Blanket. The blanket. You got the most money for being able to bring your own blanket. Yeah, it was a tough, well, all wars we know are tough. Anyway, thank you again. You will be getting a flyer on that next program in November, and then that will be the last of it for this year until next year. Thank you again, and thank you, John, for coming.